The Holy Gospel today is from Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear hearers of the word of God, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Harvest time is uh, just around the corner. In fact, in some parts of the state, uh, down south, southern parts, it's, uh, it's underway, with the uh, small grains anyway. Well, what's going on? Well, uh, you got the modern uh, combine there, or some places you have the old timer. Uh, they both work the same way. They use wind to separate the wheat from the chaff. That hasn't changed in thousands of years. The changes is using the, the modern one. They have a, an engine that drives a fan, but it works the same way. Or you let the wind work. Separating the wheat from the chaff. Separating what is good from what is worthless. Uh, we're in the Gospel of Luke this year, and, uh, and a lot of the stories and parables are, are coming from Luke. And earlier in the, in the year, uh, the church year, uh, we had uh, John the Baptist uh, speaking to us. And in Luke's story, the Luke's telling of John. It's interesting the, the, how, it, how it compares. What does he say? His winnowing fork is in his hand. He's, he's, he's separating the east of harvesting to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Jesus is trying to do that. He's there to do that, to separate what is good from what is worthless. Our readings today are all saying similar things from Colossians. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And Jesus responds to the man who says, fix it. You, fix it. <coughs> Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Take care, <coughs> be on guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist on the abundance of possessions. <coughs> when I, uh, uh, when our boys were younger teenagers, and, uh, and my nephews were about the same age, my, our brothers, there's, there's uh, six, six of us brothers, and so we go up to uh, the Boundary Waters, and one year we decided we had such a big group, and we needed a group campsite, and uh, my twin brother and I, we said, you know, we're getting kind of old to lift all that stuff. Let's, let's go to Crane Lane, there's a pontoon, and we can throw all the gear on the pontoon, and we don't have to portage. I said, I'm in for that. Well, anyway, we went to the Voyagers National Park up there, and... Uh, over the years, we, we, uh, when we first did it, we, we prided ourselves on being fishermen. But the first year, uh, we 
start. <laughs> My brother was on a was on a vegetarian diet. He was in charge of the food. So he was, oh, we don't need that much. You'll catch all the fish we need. And I said, yeah, of course we will. We didn't. <laughs> so the next couple of years, we just brought all this food and we had to carry it. You know. So we thought, oh, let's get a pontoon and throw it all on there. We just about sunk the first pontoon. In fact, I think we did sink it in too much food. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we had all this food because we didn't want to go hungry. Not that I had any danger of starving, just, just let you know here. Don't need to worry about that. But we got out to the campsite at Voyagers, and this is the first time I've been at this a national campsite, and saw one of these things. Now, when I first saw it, I thought it was a junction box like we have right over here behind the, the hedges there for electricity. I thought, no, what? No, no, no. What is it? I, and then I thought, well, maybe it's the, the bathroom. I said, no, it's right next to the picnic table. And what is it? It's a food locker. It's a food locker. And uh, there's a yellow sign on there. Oops. And this is what it says. Bear-proof locker. Protect yourself from bears. Store food in ice chests at night or when you are away from camp. Seal all garbage in a plastic bag and hang it in the tree away from camp. Do not store food in your tent. Please take all your garbage with you when you leave. Metal. And, uh, and uh, it also works as a cooking spot if it's really windy and rainy. <laughs> Put a stove in there. Uh, perfect. Why? You're in bear country. Don't leave your food around for the bears to get you, to get it, get the food. So, here's the story. There's a pilot who goes to a fishing camp in Alaska. He has a, a super cub, and a super cub is a type of plane, and it's fabric. It's steel tubing frames, like a skeleton of the plane is steel tubing, and then they wrap fabric around it, and it flies. And in Alaska, they're like a they're like a pickup truck. Everyone has them. They use them for everything. Well, he flew out to this fishing camp, and he was going to catch fish. And what do you need to catch fish? Bait. bait. He left the bait in the plane. <coughs> the bear got hungry. He ate the plane. <laughs> So he did what every, every pilot does. They adapt, they're brilliant, they improvise, they know exactly what to do. He called his buddy, he said, give me uh, two new tires, because the bear thought they were licorice lollipops. A sheet of plastic, and three cases, who said that? Are you a pilot? <laughs> Your son is a pilot. You're brilliant. Three cases of duct tape. Duct tape. So this is before, and this is after. He flew it out of there. <laughs> it worked. Three cases of duct tape. Now, what's this have to do with anything? Well, it's a funny story, but. It's one thing to be on your guard against bears in bear country. Don't leave your bait in the tent, food in the tent, or, or in your plane, right? Uh, unless you have a friend that can fly out some duct tape for you. <laughs> but what about the dangers that Jesus warns us about? Can you fix them with duct tape? You can fix a lot of things with duct tape. I'm, I'm giving you that. What does he say? Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. What kind of greed? All kinds. One kind would have been easy. Er. <laughs> uh, but he doesn't say one kind of greed. We tend to do it that in our mind. The greed of money, well that's the words, you know. It does say the love of money is the root of all evil. But there's all other kinds of greed too, isn't there? The love of money, of course. How about the greed of power? 
Can you imagine people in the world today who are grieving for power? I know, it's, I know it's hard to imagine it, but just try to imagine. Or influence, or status, or pride. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. We just had the both conventions. <laughs> I do believe we're surrounded. I'm kind of like, uh, I'm kind of feeling like these, these people here. Lions. And tigers. And bears. Oh my! Okay, good. You saw the movie. <laughs> this is from uh, the Concordia Publishing House in St. Louis. Made these children's books like 50 years ago. And, our, and we had these in our house. We have them in our child care set too. Arch books. And I remember this one. Pairs of Rumble Parables. Uh, and Jesus tells a story about what? The rich fool. <laughs> the rich fool. Now, I normally don't talk about my children in a sermon, but because Matthew's not here, I can do it. But when he was about three years old, we were, at our, we were at my mom and dad's house, and he, he laughs. We still repeat this line with him now, so he, he knows what it, and he laughs with it, so it's not that big of a deal, but. We were at uh, my mom and dad's house, Grandma and Grandpa, and the kids were all there, and Grandma and Grandpa told Miriam and I, well, you watch the, we'll watch the kids, you guys, you know, go do something, go out for supper or do something, and we'll give you a little night out. I said, okay. And uh, we came home, and the next day, Mom said, well, Matthew said something fun, kind of funny, and we I had to laugh about it, but it, it, she said, it's so true. Uh, it was around Christmas time, and she had we had this dessert table that my mom would fix up, and there's a little bowl full of M and M's. And Matthew saw the bowl, and he and mom and grandma said, "Well, do you want some M and M's?" And he kind of, yep, he held out his hand, and she put two in his hand. He looked at his hand. He looked at grandma and said, two are not enough." <laughs> Now, son, you're exactly right. Two are not enough. M&M's? Two pounds are not enough. But there's something about that. When is enough enough? And so we, we keep saying that now. Two are not enough. When is enough enough? That's what Jesus is getting at. When is enough enough? This parable, the rich fool, reminds us of the problem of greed, the, 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 the problem of, of, of getting more and more. When is enough? Enough. Right? Build bigger barns. But he doesn't say it's just from the grain. He said, and all his goods. He's got other stuff too that he's got to store. Uh, the very real danger of possessions is that they can very often do to us what we do to them. What do we do to them? We possess them. What do they do to us? They possess us. We become tied to them. Jesus is trying to say, look, you gotta have stuff, you know? He didn't, Jesus didn't walk around naked, okay? He had clothes, he ate. But he understood the, the, the power of what that can do to, to, to lure us. He said, beware, be on your guard. It's like, you're in bear country. Beware. Beware. Worse is that it's not a very big step to looking at what we have and then to equate that and be convinced that our lives themselves can be managed and put in a, in a shed or a building or whatever we want to do or a safe deposit box or, or whatever. And that we can possess them our own souls. But why does God call, uh, and why does the arch books call this the rich fool? Uh, by every modern measure, uh, this man is a bright and shiny example of success. Doesn't seem very foolish. He's not cheating. You know, Jesus doesn't say this crooked guy uh, got his crops to grow by some magical spell. No. He's not a thief. He didn't steal the grain. He had land. It grew. His crops produced abundantly. 
the Edgar Harbors worked hard. Uh, what's his? What's the issue? It's not about the stuff he has at all. But listen to how he speaks. How Jesus has him tell the first person encounter. Rich man, he's so he's going to speak. What does he say? He thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, build large ones in there. I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, do you get the, how annoying that was when I just did that? Can you imagine God hearing some, there's a parable how Jesus is, is making up the story. But we, we can see, we can sense it. That's what draws us in. And we think, what? This guy is pretty what? Self-centered. Uh, Martin Luther says that the nature of sin is that we're curved in on ourselves. We, we, we just curved in. Latin phrase, in curvatus in sin. We are curved in amongst ourselves. It's not that he had abundant crops. That's not the issue. <laughs> he has fallen prey to the worshiping the most popular of gods, the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. That's the problem. That's where it is. It's easy to become, uh, to blame it. Well, it's because he had all this stuff. That's why. Anybody with a lot of stuff, they're all greedy. No, that's not true. There's a lot of very generous people who have a lot of stuff. In the Bible, Abraham was one of the wealthiest people in the Bible. Jesus, uh, God said to him, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a lot of stuff. Be so that you can what? Be a blessing. It's when it comes to this, that's what Jesus is talking about. I got it all together. I can even say to my soul, you've got it all together. You're secure. Again, he's not foolish because he makes provision for the future. He is foolish because he believes that all of the stuff can secure the future. There's a difference. There's a difference. And uh, the, what, I, what, I, what I don't like about this parable is I see myself like this guy. I know it's not true. My life does not consist of the abundance of my possessions. I preach it. In fact, I'm doing it right this very minute. But then I say, well, you know, if I had a little bit more, it would be nice to have a little more for college, and then we could have some retirement, and blah, blah, blah. And I catch myself kind of getting into that same mode. I mean, again, it's nice to plan ahead. you got to do that. But then you can see how easy it is to get how it kind of possesses you into thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And I find myself talking just like this guy was. <laughs> Jesus, you did it again. You nailed me. Gets us. The lure of all this stuff, the, the illusion that it creates is that we are independent from God. It promises us that uh, if once we have all our stuff together, our stuff in a pile, the right piles, and where they're supposed to be, uh, we can transcend being human. <laughs> but we know that's not true. You can't be a self-made man in a God-made world. After all, Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. It came out with a song. Can't buy me love. And uh, can't buy me love, can't we? Can't. I don't care too much for money. Money can't buy me love. I'll buy you a diamond ring, my friend, if it makes you feel all right. I'll give you everything, my friend, if it makes you feel all right. No, you know, hit, hit song. And it's nice to know that money can't buy us love. Uh, in 1966, after a couple years after the song came out, he, uh, Paul McCartney was asked, "What's what's the real thing about this song?" 
Is it about prostitution? He said, what are you talking about? No. The idea behind it is that all these material possessions are all very well, but they won't buy me what I really want. Huh? He's right. Money can't buy us love. Money, possession, stuff can't buy us what Jesus has given us either. This is what our Luther had to say about it. Jesus, he has freed me from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Not with silver or gold, but with his holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Our lives are a gift given to us by God. We have been entrusted with it. We are stewards of everything that God has given us. Ourselves, our time, our possessions, everything that we have are signs of God's gracious love to us. And our lives, as Colossians tells us, are hidden with Christ and God. Hidden with Christ and God. That's kind of a different way of saying. What does that what does it mean? We're hidden in Christ with God. And a seminary professor at the, when I was there, Lee Snook, he said, it means we're baked in the same cake. We're all maybe that's mixed in there. We're baked in the same cake. You can't separate us from it. We're baked in the same cake. As the singer said uh, this morning in the gathering music, turn your eyes upon who? Jesus. He is our life. We just sang it in our sermon hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Not a possession, but he's ours. Everything he has, we have. His worth, our worth. His riches, our riches. His life, our life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand. Let us uh, continue now with our confession of faith.